Good morning, church. How you doing this morning? Are we blessed? Amen. Amen. Well, why don't we, I like your enthusiasm, Jacob. Why don't we get up real quick so we can pray and we can start this service on this special uh, Palm Sunday. Are you okay with that? Let's stand on our feet so we can pray real quick and ask God to come. I know he already is here because the, uh, the Bible says when two or three people gather in his name, he's there. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus is here right now, and he's going to be here with us throughout the service, and he's going to make things happen for us this morning. So if you close your eyes and join me in prayer, God, I thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you that you woke us up this morning and bring us to church, and we have a purpose, God. And you're going to help us fulfill that purpose as long as we open up our hearts. Lord, I just ask you to send the Holy Spirit and fill us in a different way this morning, God. I thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. And I thank you for everyone that came in today and this morning and for those that are watching online, God. I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name I pray this morning. Amen. And while you are standing up, why don't you greet one another? Just say hi to somebody that you haven't seen in a while. And then welcome back. Okay, let me, uh, let me give you a few announcements as you make your way back to your seat. You won't want to miss these, I don't think. Somewhere I have them. It got quiet, good. Um, hey, there's only, there's only two big announcements. Um, we'll say that this, this week is a regular week for us. We kind of did some of our Holy Week stuff um, last week with the Passover um, celebration that we did together. Um, but so this will be a regular week for Wednesday night ministry starting at six and ending at eight. And then um, we have the Easter egg hunt coming up this Saturday from 11 to, is it 11 to noon? 11 to one. To one. Yeah, 11 to one. So um, if you have yet to grab your Easter eggs and fill those up and bring them back, you still have time. You can bring them to the church uh, by this Wednesday. So please go ahead and, and plan on doing that if you haven't done that yet. Uh, be ready for the Easter egg hunt. And then it's, it's, we're working our way towards Easter. As of yet, we don't have anyone on the schedule to be baptized. But you're, if you're thinking, um, man, this is for me. This is, this is my time. This is my year. I haven't been baptized yet, and I want to make that happen. Uh, definitely let us know. No time um, is, will be too late for that. So um, that's, that's all for announcements today. I just want to encourage you uh, to say, hey, let the Lord work in your heart today. Go ahead and stand as we go in, into a time of worship.
desire still and all alone oh praise the name of the lord our god oh praise his name forevermore for endless days we will sing your praise oh lord oh lord our god and on the of us that we remember to separate the world that we're so submerged in Lord, to die to ourselves and pick up our cross and carry it each day 
to put you first, not last or second or whatever, but you first. Holy Spirit, come and flow through this place. Shake us. Shake the very foundation that we're standing on. We need to be shaken. Remind us of what you've done for us, Lord. Of the blood shed for us and the freedom that we have. kind of failed to mention that, you know, there's offering. Uh, if you if you want to give offering uh, in church today, there's the boxes in the back and then um, kind of uh, through the app or, or the check if you need to mail that in, you can do that as well. Um, I kind of failed to mention those things. I also forgot to mention that there's breakfast next week. There's breakfast. So if you want to come, I think the breakfast will start around 10 o'clock um, and then uh, we'll go into the service at 1045 like normal. So I kind of forgot those announcements. I do have one special announcement that I was saving till now. Um, and and that has to do with the fact that uh, uh, Cindy Cannon, who's been our longtime treasurer, is, is retiring, officially has retired. Cindy, are you? Yeah, there you are. Would you mind coming up here? I, I didn't prepare you for that, but you might have known that was coming. Come on up. Um, Cindy, uh, yeah, you can clap for Cindy. Cindy has done a lot for the church. She had two separate times as, uh, two separate times. Here, let me grab this now. I hid these back here. Yeah, there you go. So we have these uh, flowers for you in the card, and uh, people may wish to also kind of tell you some things. Uh, like that. Let's come closer to the center so everyone can see it. I know your family's here in, in the back as well. You get, what, would you guys stand? Can we get, I'm sorry, I didn't prepare you for this. Can we get the lights on real quick? We just want to recognize that Cindy's family are church-going people. They just go to another church, and Cindy has made the commitment to be here. Yeah. So thanks for sharing your mom or grandma with, with us here at Valley View. Um, Cindy's not going away. Uh, she's just not working here anymore. Okay, so don't worry, Cindy's still here, um, but we wanted to let you know that um, Cindy is, is so important to the church that when she actually retires, we actually had to get two people to replace her. Um, so uh, Misty Ebenkamp is taking over some of those kind of uh, bookkeeping and financial responsibilities, and then Jill, Pastor Jill, is kind of uh, taking some of the communication things. So you know what, it's going to be weird for a little while, but just know that all that weirdness is just doing without Cindy because um, she's been a part of the church for so long. Let me just say this one last thing. I don't want to make you cry. Uh, but when, when I first came, uh, this was two and a half years ago, Cindy said, you know, I was really looking at retiring, and, and she had retired, and, and we convinced her to come back. This was a long time ago. How, do you remember the year that you retired first? 2015. 2015. And then, uh, and then we convinced her to come back when, when that person had to move away. Um, and, and so she came back again, but she told me, you know, Pastor, I really, I really was going to retire. And then uh, Pastor Larry, who was pastor here before me, uh, he left, and I felt like I needed to stay. And the truth is, Cindy was the glue that held the church together uh, for me and Jill as we first came. She really did an awesome job with that, and I don't know where, how we would have done it. And then she kind of said, you know, Pastor, I'm think, thinking about retiring because you're here. Everything seems to be going well. And we said, no, 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 just stay a little bit longer. And, and every time she said, I'm thinking about retiring, uh, we kept saying just a little bit longer. And finally we said, okay, Cindy, you can retire. And then the funny thing was, her last day was supposed to be last Thursday. On Wednesday night, she said, Pastor, I'm not coming in tomorrow. I'm done. So she's retired. Don't bring her your, your questions, okay? She's retired. But thank you, Cindy, so much. Uh, yeah, it, and, and, and um, we just appreciate everything you've done in, 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 in service of the church and of the Lord. So thank you so much. God bless you. Yeah, keep praying. So it's, uh, it's Palm Sunday now, and we're on to the Word. And, you know, the, 
no matter which lectionary year, if you follow that, you know what that is, there's three of them, they repeat. No matter which lectionary year it is, it's a time that we begin to speak about Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem. Now, Jesus has been to Jerusalem before, right? But now we're talking about his, his final arrival. Uh, the passage that David alluded to, it says he set his sight on Jerusalem, right? And then later on, it says Jesus just, the shortest scripture, uh, shortest verse in scripture, it says Jesus wept. And so he's, he's beginning to look at Jerusalem and realize this is my job. And as he comes in, it's kind of like um, the, the arrival of, of a king or someone who's, who's important. And, and, and so they call this the triumphal entry. And triumphal entries aren't just something that existed in the Bible. They, they existed as largely a Roman thing, but there would be a version of this in many different cultures. And I was, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the time that, that I went to preach in Colorado Springs for the Col- Dis- Colorado District NYI convention. And I was to speak there four times. And as I was getting ready, they would ask me, you know, by email, they would send me a question. Hey, uh, what's some, where'd you go to school? And tell us about your family and, and this kind of biographical information. And what's your sermon series going to be on? And I would send them that. And what scripture is going to use? And this kind of thing. And one of the questions somewhere in there was, what's a good song? What's a good song for you? I believe is how it was worded. And I thought, in my mind, I thought that means what's a song you like? So uh, this was 2009, and, and so uh, top of the country charts, 2009, uh, one of them was uh, The Truth by Jason Aldean. You don't have to know this song to know this, uh, to know how to, for this to make sense, but as I'm walking up on the platform, and it's, there's a few hundred youth there and, and, and sponsors and things, there's probably 500 people there, and so it's kind of a good walk up to the platform. And as I'm walking up to the platform, I hear this slow, sad country song come on. And I'm thinking, oh no. That question, which song do you like, was, my, was kind of my intro song request. And I had no idea. So every, all four times that I spoke, I walked up to tell them anything you want to, just don't tell them the truth. <laughs> and I thought, man, that was, that was not how I would have planned it. Um, one time, I believe, it even got up, I was trying to let it go further, and it got up to the, to the bridge, and it says, uh, um, the truth is, I'm asking you to lie, and I know that it's not right, but uh, would you please have mercy on me? So, <laughs> then I preached, and uh, kids came to the altar, or whatever, I don't know. But, um, Anyway, so, so this is, uh, and, and you know, you see that now even like with, with baseball teams and the kids are getting up and they got their song playing and, and different things. You see this a lot. And, or if you've been to a Solid Poodles game, you'll see that as well. And you start to memorize which song goes with which player. But uh, there's something about music that seemed to set the tone for that, um, for, for someone coming in. But then uh, triumphal entries in particular that we have in Scripture that would have existed outside of Scripture but at the same time, this was, a, this was a big affair, right? This was a big deal. And so as um, usually this is going to be like a conquering king, they're coming into town, and as they come, uh, people are lining the streets. There would actually be a guy whose job it was to go and get people psyched up and pumped up. There's probably several people that would do this. So we'd run around and they'd say, okay, hey, y'all, y'all let's go get, get, get together. Um, the king is coming through uh, or the general and they've won this battle and they're about to come through. So everyone get ready. And so this was something they were used to and, and conquered people. Conquered people would have this happen to them. So when Rome came in and conquered Jerusalem, which we don't have in uh, older New Testaments, kind of we have those stories in the Apocrypha. If you know what that is, uh, you know, you'll have to look that up later. But, um, and, and so we have those stories. And what would have happened is after they conquered Jerusalem, they would have said, now here's the guy. Here's the guy that conquered you. Here is your new king. And they would have to lie in the streets. They would wait for him to come and they would be, you know, kind of expected to celebrate him and, and, and almost worship him for the sake of um, appeasing their new ruler. And so uh, this is kind of what happens. It's usually a military event. Um, this is usually done in important cities, capital cities, where Jerusalem wasn't important to almost anyone except for the Jews. But then because it was important to the Jews, it became then important to um, uh, to the Romans as well. Because if you want to conquer the Jews, you have to conquer Jerusalem. Um, and they, they would be for the sake of announcing 
Uh, so they're military in key cities, and they announced a past victory, a victory that's already happened, it's already taken place. So now we're going to come and we're going to announce that. So um, we'll look at this in just a little while, but um, Jesus' entry is not quite the same manner, even if we want to call it a triumphal entry. So if you're following along with your notes, here's our big idea. Paul Sun- Palm Sunday comes to us between the mission and the cross, between this new way of being in the world that is, or that Jesus ushered into existence, modeled in every aspect of his life and handed over to his followers, and the cross, which is the ultimate destination of this new sort of life. So Palm Sunday comes to us between the mission and the cross. And that's where we're invited to as we read this passage from Psalm, uh, I don't know I have Psalm in my mind from last week, from Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied to a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. (coughs) Excuse me. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you. (coughs) Humble and mounted on a donkey. (coughs) (coughs) Man, I'm sorry, excuse me. (coughs) (coughs) I wish there was something else you could do besides look at me right now. All right. I have this uh, saved here in my pocket, and I had one earlier, but here we go. Your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them and that followed them were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. (coughs) Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were we're saying, this is the prophet, Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Dear Jesus, help my throat. Um, so, what you have here is interesting. Jesus comes. Um, he hasn't announced a past victory, right? Jesus just kind of comes in. There's not a victory being announced been a military battle. Jesus isn't a military leader of some kind, and yet he comes in in this same way, and it it happens in such a strange, (coughs) (coughs) it happens in such a strange way that people begin to say, "Who, who is this? Normally during a triumphal entry, you would know who this was. It would have been announced, it would have been the king, um, but Jesus comes in such an unusual way that they're, they're confused about who it is, John, what's happening. And so the, the questions begin to fly. Um, Jesus comes in a very humble way, in a poor way. He comes, um, is, is the mic cutting out a lot, or is it just me coughing? All right, all right, good. <laughs> Can't do anything about that one. <laughs> but... Um, and so it comes in a humble way. It's an outlying city, right? The Romans don't really care about this city except for if they want to control the Jews. It's a city they have to have. And then also, he's announcing a future victory. You understand, you understand the significance here? They're thinking, what, vic- <coughs> what victory is this guy announcing? <coughs> what battle has... Jesus and his band of disciples, this guy from Nazareth in Galilee, what have they won? And the issue for us is that this battle was coming. 
this victory was coming in, in the days to come. And uh, it would last an eternity. It was the last battle that we needed, the last spiritual battle we needed, the last spiritual victory. And Jesus comes and he brings that to us. So um, between the mission and the cross, Jesus already set his eyes on Jerusalem. He's already wept over Jerusalem. He's already decided this is the last time. Um, what are the things that, so some of the things that Jesus has been doing is he's been healing people, right? He's been preaching and teaching. He's traveling throughout the countryside. He's uh, casting out evil spirits. He's confronting um, some of the, the leaders uh, of the religious establishment and, 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 and kind of getting into a little bit of spats with them and performing these signs and miracles. Jesus doesn't stop doing these things. He, he continues them as he comes. So his mission is still taking place, right? His mission of bringing love, salvation, transformation, and place of judgment and death. And in in where there were outsiders, he creates insiders. And um, he continues this uh, confrontation as he gets in uh, to Jerusalem. Because when he goes in, he almost immediately goes straight away to the temple. And you know this story, right? He goes in the temple and he sees what's happening there. And it's not like he hadn't been there before. It's not like he hadn't, hadn't been there around Passover before. Jesus knew what was taking place. And he said, this is it. I got my eyes set on the cross, right? I'm in the mission, but my eyes are set on the cross. And if my eyes are set on the cross, I'm going to do those final things that I can only do if I know that I'm surrendering my life. So he goes in and he flips the tables fashions a, a whip out of some cords that he chases the animals out. This is kind of um, attributed as one of the main reasons Jesus was sought to be killed. Breaking the law was one thing. They didn't like that he did stuff on Sabbath. They didn't like that they were constantly embarrassed. But getting his hands on their money, right, it was a big deal. Now, I want to be important. I want you, it's important that you understand that it's not like we weren't allowed to sell stuff in church, and therefore that's the reason. I remember growing up, um, um, my sister wanted to sell Girl Scout cookies at church, and they were like, no, sorry, you can't do that. Uh, Jesus flipped those tables and ended selling anything at church. Um, and one of the things that our, our guest speaker, um, uh, who came and celebrated the Passover with us, one of the things he mentioned as well, is the fact that this was an important thing. Uh, they needed the money changers. They needed the sale of animals for sacrifice. As if you can imagine walking hundreds of miles, and some people might have been traveling from as far as Ethiopia, um, from as far away as uh, Rome, and traveling, they couldn't carry all these animals with them that they needed for the sacrifices. Right? So you show up at the temple, and I've got my... I don't know, Ethiopian money with me, and I need to change that into temple money. So I change that into temple money, so that's where it's important, but uh, always at a very, um, I don't know, profitable exchange for the temple, right? So the temple was making lots of money, and every time they exchanged, exchanged currency. Then finally, then, you had the animals, and it was like the animals that you needed, and you had your, your from the best sacrifice down to the lowest sacrifice, both not just in kind of animal, but quality. And so you can imagine showing up and being like, I just walked hundreds of miles. It took me months, and, and I'm here, and I've got my money that I've been saving. I've gone without food. I've, gone, I've slept out in the open. And I've done everything I could to make sure I saved this money so that my sacrifice could come. And guess what? It's not enough. Or maybe... You're just able to buy like a, I don't know, like a little pigeon or something, and you needed, you needed a whole calf. And so it, 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 it was a difficult thing, and there was some abuse taking place there. So Jesus shows up, and he flips the tables, he runs them all out, and he says that, that basically um, this kind of thing isn't allowed. And it wasn't the fact that they were selling things that made it bad. It was the fact that there was injustice, oppression, and abuse taking place in the house of the Lord. And so, um, ultimately, these are the actions that would lead to his death. Uh, and if we participate in actions like this, they will most certainly lead to our death as well. Um, so just, just keep that in mind as we're between the mission and the cross. So uh, some of these things that, that would do that then are surrounding yourself with sinners, prostitutes, and other unsavory characters. Isn't that weird? You think about it. 
we, we're, we're always so worried about who we're seen with, right? We don't want to be seen with this person. What might it mean? Think about, think about it. If, if, if you saw me, uh, I don't know, if you saw me, you, your pastor at a place where there were, uh, I don't know, lots of drug dealers, what would you say? Oh, no. Pastor's doing drugs, right? What if you saw me at a place where there were lots of, prostit- lots of prostitutes? Oh, no, what's pastor up to? These are the things that will eventually lead to your dismissal or your downfall and sometimes even to your death. So Jesus was surrounding himself with sinners, prostitutes, other unsavory characters. This is what he did. And oftentimes the word comes back to Jesus like this. Don't you know who you're with? Don't you know who this person is? And one of my favorite responses to that question was, well, it's not healthy people who need a doctor, but sick people who need a doctor. So that's what I'm here for, the sick. Uh, Another thing that Jesus did was um, preaching, teaching, training, planting churches. Or planting the church, right? Planting communities of faith. And so as Jesus comes and he does that, he's involved in those things, he recognizes that, yeah, in a few days, I'll be crucified and it'll be my my last time here. But even in that time, he keeps teaching He keeps confronting, um, or he keeps teaching, he keeps preaching, and he keeps doing on the mission, or keeps carrying on the mission uh, that was handed over to him from his heavenly father. He continues that. No matter, there's no point in his life where he says, okay, my mission is over, right? There's no point in which you can say, okay, um, I've done enough of the mission. You know, it's been three and a half years of this walking around. Boy, is my back tired? Are my feet tired? And I'm just tired of doing all this. No, he, he realizes, even in my last days, I'm going to be doing what the Lord asked me to do. Could you, could you imagine? What, don't, isn't that the way that you want to go? Don't you want to be like there and like you're, you're, you, you just, you don't know it, but you've just got a few days left to live and you're there sharing scripture with somebody? You're there encouraging somebody, testifying to somebody, serving in your church? Wouldn't you, and, and the truth is, for so many of us, we don't get to pick the time of our, our leaving, right? We don't, we don't, well, we definitely don't, most no one gets to pick, uh, but you definitely don't know that time, right? You're there one day and, and you could not be the next. Uh, any, any moment could be our last, right? And so the fact is that you don't want to be waiting for that end time and say, okay, well, now I'm done with the mission. Now I wait till the end. Um, I think that we'd all rather look back and say, man, if I could have known that I just had a little bit of time left, if I could have known I only had two more years, if I could have known I only had one month, if I known I only had two days, I, I would have been a lot more busy doing stuff. Problem is, you almost never get to pick. You almost never get to know. And then those moments are our last moments. So something else that Jesus did that leads to his death, he confronts powers and systems of abuse, right? That was getting down to the... the, the the casting out of the temple, um, the way he came in, people would have said, who does this guy think he is? How are they shouting Hosanna in the highest? How are they shouting uh, praises to God when this guy comes in? That makes no sense. Who does he think he is? And it's confronting the systems and the powers and the authorities um, on, on Sabbath, uh, on the selling of things in the temple. Um, and there's a number of things that they want to use as an excuse to kill Jesus. And so that confrontation. And I wonder, are we willing to confront systems of abuse when we see them? I've shared before about things that were taking place in Congo, and I, and I, I confronted those. As a missionary, as an outsider, it's easy to confront those things. It's much harder to see the system of abuse that exists in our own culture and our own society because that's who we are. That's where we were born, where we exist. But are we willing when we hear of abuse when we see systems of oppression, are we willing to say, you know what? I'm not going to participate in that anymore. But instead, I'm going to speak out against it. If you do, you will be like Christ. But if you do, you will also contribute towards likely your own death. Even Even if it's a cultural or spiritual death, you might be contributing to it in that way as well. So in spite of all of this, Jesus goes away. 
Jesus carries on the mission anyway. And I wonder what you might say in your life, the reason why you can't know God better, seek God more fervently, follow Jesus more closely, whatever it might be, serve the church better, um, testimony, testify to others better. You might say, well, there's all of these reasons why I can't do it. I just want to let you know, Jesus knew he was going to die, and he did it anyway. He knew from when he set his eyes on Jerusalem, this is my last trip in. And he went anyway. And I want to encourage us, when we see that we're heading down those paths for the sake of the kingdom, to go anyway. So in the temple, instead of a a system of helping people find forgiveness and restore relationship with God, it had become a system of abuse of power and the accumulation of wealth. Um, So your blanks there on the notes forgiveness, and power. Um, It's kind of jumping around on those. So what I wonder is, um, if we were, if we were standing, if we were in the streets, I don't know, I don't know, I don't hang out in the street. Um, I don't hang out, you know, people don't, I don't really see people, I see people walking their dogs because my dogs get mad and they bark, but if you could imagine like a parade coming through town and, and it was like an impromptu parade, this might be a good a kind of example of what it was like for Jesus. You kind of just, you know, you're looking out your, your doors and you're saying, what, what's happening? There's a parade coming through. Oh, okay, yeah. So everyone just kind of goes outside. But then you can just kind of get caught up in the, in the, the parade atmosphere. So you get caught up in it and, and you start to shout all these things. Uh, Hosanna in the highest. Praise be the one that comes in the name of the Lord. And you're saying all these things and you're like, who is this guy again? Who is this guy in the first place? And so as, as they're doing that, they realize, oh, you're saying that this is Jesus, the prophet Jesus. That's weird. Because in their mind, they expected a Messiah. They, they waited for the Messiah to come. Our, our speaker this past Wednesday during the uh, uh, Passover uh, demonstration said that the Jews today are still waiting for the Messiah to come. And I think, oh, man. See, what happened was they had put Jesus in this little box, and they expected Je- the, the, they put the Messiah in this box. They said, here is what the Messiah is supposed to be. Here's what he's supposed to do. Here's what he's supposed to look like. Here's the things he's going to say. Here's how he's going to talk. They had all these things, and it was just in this box. They said, this is the Messiah right here. So when they saw Jesus come up, now they look at Jesus, and they look at their box, and they say, nope, that's not the Messiah, Right? And, and I think so often we do the same thing today, right? We put Jesus in our little box and we say, this is what God wants from me. This is what it means for me to be a follower. And we have this idea, and it's this little thing here. We say, that, that's all that's needed. That's all that's required. But the truth is, God is shattering our box mentality. He's breaking that mold so we can understand that he's doing new things in us and in the world today, and that he's calling us to be a part of them. So don't put Jesus in a box. Don't put your faith your hope, your religion, uh, your idea of what it means when, when Jesus will come again in a box. And I think, man, I don't want to miss out when Jesus comes again. Because remember, I, I've made my own box. I've got a whole Bible full of things that help me make my box. So it's, it's probably a good box. But now I imagine Jesus is coming back again one day and, and here's that box. And what happens if it doesn't fit? Will I reject the second coming of Christ? Or will I accept it? Will I throw my box out? and just accept what the Lord's doing. So the Jews were looking for a specific Messiah. There still are today. Um, The one that we got was the Messiah that the the Jews received so long ago, that we all received uh, 2,000 years ago, um, had no concern for political um, standing, uh, did all that he could to refuse violent action and activity and, and uh, rejected military power as well. There were times when they tried to come and make this guy a king by force, and, and he rejected that. I mean, I don't know. I mean, even if it was a small town, if someone wanted to make me king, I might just say yes. You know, I might be like, okay. Oh, you want me to be president? Okay, fine. I'll do it. Jesus says no. He's not going to do that. That's not his job. That's not his role. So even though the Jews are holding up this box, here's what Jesus looks like. He comes and he does this other stuff. But here's, here's one of the primary things that Jesus was doing is he made insiders into outsiders and outsiders into insiders. He flipped the world upside down. Jews, um, 
uh, scribes, the chief priests, uh, Pharisees, Sadducees, the ones who were considered to be the highest up in society, in his society, he, he put them underneath. He put them as outsiders. Why? Because they refused to accept the word that Jesus was bringing. They refused to accept what God was doing here and now and just waited for some idea they had, they had built about who Jesus was or who the Messiah was. At the same time, he took prostitutes and sinners, tax collectors, Gentiles, Samaritans, people who were on the outside. He said, guess what? You're a part of my family now. All you have to do is follow me. And part of that following is often repent and believe. Repent and believe. He also, here's another thing that Jesus did as far as the insiders and outsiders, is he came to the kids and he said, hey, everyone, the kids are who you should be like. I think, what? Not the kids. They, they don't even know what they're up to. They have no idea what's going on. Jesus said, yeah, the kids, those are the ones. So give respect and honor to the kids. In fact, you should be like the kids. You should have faith like the kids. And if you can have faith like them and you can imitate them, then you will have a place in them. So he flipped the world upside down. So Christ transcends our understanding of who God is, and therefore, we must have a relationship with him. And, and the transcendence necessitates a relationship. Because as good as my box is, what if I make my box really big, right? And I've used scripture, and, I, and I've used tradition, I've used my own reasoning, and, and I've got this box together, and I say, here is who Jesus is. Here is what it's going to be like when he comes again. Here's how the world's going to be transformed. Here's how we're going to be taken up heaven and all these things about uh, the end of this age and then the, and then the, of the age to come. And, and I have all this box set up and, 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 I, and I imagine this is exactly what it is. The truth is it could be wrong. It could be aired. It could be flawed. It could be a little skewed. And the only way I'm going to fix my box is to have a relationship with Jesus. To know him personally spend time in prayer and meditation on scripture and, 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 and including allowing Jesus time to speak back to me. And so we might have to end up throwing our box away and just saying, Lord, constantly teach me anew each and every single day. And that's, that's where we are when we're in between the mission and the cross. We say, G what, Jesus, what step do I take? And it, it has to, there has to be a relationship there for that to happen. So I want to encourage our worship team to begin to make their way back up. And I want to ask us um, just kind of a question as we um, get ready to end here. Uh, are, are you putting Jesus in a box? Have you already figured out beyond a shadow of a doubt everything that will happen in the world, in the church, in your life when Jesus comes again? See, I believe that Jesus comes for a specific purpose. But sometimes we might be like the Pharisees who, who have a different idea made up. We don't understand what that purpose is. When we come for prayer, we, we come right away and say, God, thank you for this. Help me with this. We need this. We need that. Help us, Lord. And we, we end instead of saying, um, Lord, thank you for what you're doing in the world. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done in the past, what you're going to do. Sometimes we make it about us as so we ask for our needs and our, desi and our desires to be fulfilled. If you're still trying to put Jesus in the box, it's hard to follow him, right? You ever, you ever, you know, when you were a kid, you run around, you grab a, a toad or a lizard or, I don't know, roly polies or something. Did you do that? Uh, I think their girls do that too. I don't, I'm not sure. But then you put them in a little box, a grasshopper, whatever it is, uh, and you put it in a box, you say, look what I have. And guess what happens? It always dies, right? It cannot live in your little box. And so you have to be willing to let our, our whatever we catch, we have to be willing to release. That's a fisherman's terms, right? We have to be willing to release whatever we catch. If I, re if I received something from Jesus, if I caught his grace, if I received his grace and my life has been transformed, I can't say, okay, the way that it happened for me is the only way. The way that Jesus transformed me and worked in my life, that's the only way. That's the only thing he does. That would be wrong. That's keeping Jesus in that little box. So you need to be willing to open that box or chuck the box out after 
we let our preconceived notions, um, uh, or after we let that, those concepts out. And so then I want to challenge us. Allow the Spirit to open your mind, expand your understanding during this Holy Week. And we're, again, we're just going to have regular services this week, but don't miss out on the fact that this is a significant time. That you are, from this Sunday to next Sunday, we're right in the middle. From this Sunday to Friday, we're in between uh, the mission and the cross. In Philippians 1.9, Paul says that he's praying that their love might abound more and more in knowledge and in the depth of insight. I don't know, have you ever prayed that you would be smarter? Did you realize that love was a part of that prayer? If you did, let's try it this morning. Father, we thank you that you're bigger, more mysterious, more loving and grace-filled than we could ever imagine. No matter how big we make our box, Lord, you would always be too big for that box. And so we, we just reject the confining of your glove and your grace and we ask that you continue to stretch us and expand us. We pray for knowledge and depth of insight, Lord. And this would lead us towards love as opposed to hate and rejection. This would lead us to look more like your son that says, um, uh, who came not that the world might be condemned, but the, that the world might be saved. Lord, we don't want to be people who reject others, but people who love and accept we believe that transformation comes by your grace. So Lord, help us to continually be transformed and to bring that transformation to others. And as we don't know which day will be our last, we pray also, Lord, that we would just be motivated by mission all the time. Strengthen our hearts, strengthen our resolve to follow you, even if we're in an uncomfortable place, Lord, to let you lead us to be with who, whomever you want, wherever you want us to be, at whatever time, Lord, stretch us and make us uncomfortable for your will and your ways, and we trust you to do this, for it's in Christ's name that we pray.
Psalm 47, 5 through 7. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amidst the sound of trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to Him a psalm of praise. Father, thank you so much for our time together this morning. We place all our burdens in your hands. And as Lent comes to a close, focus our hearts on your incredible gospel as we prepare to celebrate you on Resurrection Sunday. Help us share your gospel and help us see all your miracles. You are the most high, the only one worthy of our praise. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.